You guys a brief list of commands will help you out. There's probably a few extra ones that you won't need. Good. But on the back sheet, I tried to align some things which you may not have seen yet. Some things like access control lists, virtual lands. This is down the second year of Cisco. I teach over at City College. I teach the Cisco program right there and security program. Okay, so you guys ready? Pretty good. All right. So, some of the basic ones, just to kind of see where we are. If you click on any of the Cisco devices, you're going to get a screen like this. I don't see anything in this packet tracer too much where they're going to ask you to fill the modules in. But if you needed to, for example, if you were making some serial links, you click on like a Wig 2T, and it gives you the module you need. Cisco basically it's plug and play. It's going to tell you things like turn it off before you plug it in because they're not hot swappable. But if they have something in there where they tell you to put up a serial link and they don't have one in, this is how you find the H2T. H2, uh, H2 basically, get there. You just, it'll drop it in and tell me. See, it's going to argue with me because the power's on. Turn it off. Turn it on. And we're all set. So, in basically most of the Cisco classes, they actually don't use the CLI tab, but they use the patent for Patriot, I think. It's fairly similar. Hey, yeah, they actually, I know some of the things I've seen, is they actually have the config tab locked. So you do have to go. Yeah, sometimes what they have, they don't have it here, but basically in the real world, what you do is take out a laptop and hook it up, a console cable, or what they call a Cisco console cable to them. But I don't see that on this one. If you need to do something like that, I can show you. So anyway, the CLI tab gets you to everybody's favorite, and of course you've got to actually hit everybody. And this is actually what it looks like on the real routers too. Okay. okay, so what you if they, if you get something like this, you're going to type in no because you don't want that. If you get that, it's going to give you a little menu like walk you through an install. Fall, fall, fall. So you're going to click now, hit return, and now you guys can see it's caught right there. You see where it says router, greater than symbol, or what's called user's mode, just the basic entry. Okay. Also, what it tells you, if you see something that says router or switch, it tells you, like they say in the scenario, it's fresh out of the box. Either never been used, or the configuration's been wiped out. So. One of the things they have you guys do in the scenario is to give the router a name. Okay, is this making sense for you guys? You doing okay? All right, thanks. To get there, you type in the word enable. I have that on the sheet as well. Then that gets you into what's called privilege mode. Okay, a little more what you can do. Where you really actually do things though is what's called global configuration. You get there by typing in, I'm gonna type in fig T because you can abbreviate the Cisco LAN. That's actually configured terminal. If you type in the first three letters of any command, it'll figure out what you want. So it saves yourself a lot of time typing. Unless you guys like to type. What do you guys like to type? <laughs> what are the classes for you? Okay, so every time, you see how it changes every time? Here we're in user mode, greater than symbol. We're in privilege mode. Pound sign, or some of you guys may call it a hashtag. And then we get this, always type no when it asks you if you want to enter the initial configuration. Now we can actually tell the router what we want it to do, what we want it to know. Okay, so far so good. Okay, I've got it pretty well listed, I think, on the sheets for you. If you guys have questions, so just be sure to ask, no problem. Okay, so for the first thing, one of the first things I ask you guys to do is to give the router a name. So in the scenario, they gave it something like, you have to use a command post name. They call it right now, something right house road. Oh, thank you very much, you're welcome. Now you see the underscores going in? You can't put spaces in the name. If you put spaces in the name for a router switch, it's just going to it's just going to come back to the previous screen like, I don't know what you want. So there can't be any space underscores, things like that. Will work. So we hit the enter key, and now we see things change, right? It's a router. 
now it actually this what it is. Okay, so some other things I'm sure they're going to ask you to do are things like this. There are different ways to put passwords in. If you do an, do an, a, an enable, what's called enable password, the password you want to use, it's going to be clear text. So if they have you put things in like that, they're probably going to have you use the other command that was for you there, which is called service password encryption. That will then encrypt all the passwords. Okay. In this particular scenario, they went right to the main deal, which is enable secrets, which will automatically encrypt the passwords. So we type in enable secrets, and we're just going to call it, we'll just call it Bob, we'll make it easy. They've got a really long, they get some really complex passwords in that scenario. Yeah. So we call it Bob. There we are. <clears throat> the next time we want to get into privilege mode, we've got to use Bob. So far, so good. Now, so sure. do you have to be in privilege mode to send a password? You have to be in global configuration. Yeah. So you're going to notice every time it's going to change. Right now, you see how it changed. Add to, to this right here, config. That tells you your global configuration. That's where you're actually creating <coughs> the file that's going to be looked at by the router to tell it what to do, what its name is, what IP addresses it's going to use, what routing protocols, passwords, anything like that. Okay. So we're doing okay so far? Kind of falling down the list a little bit as, as best I can. Uh, if, if they ask you to set a console password or a user password, you're going to see those lines right there. Line console zero. Okay, everything then is a console. First you have to points a console. So the other points as well. Console zero. And let's see, they use password Cisco in this case. And then log in. Now the password is set. So next time somebody wants to access the router, they're going to be challenged by a password, which is system, in case they ask you that. Okay. Okay. One thing they also may ask you is to set up Telnet. I noticed that. That was kind of interesting. They didn't go all the way to SSH yet. But it's pretty simple. So every time you do this, you see how the, the prompt changes? It tells you where you are. Right now we're on the line, we're basically configuring the console. All we have to do is type in exit. And you see we're back in configuration. Exit will take you back or quick. <clears throat> so if you want to set the console password, set the, the telnet password, this one I would take note of because I, that, at least in this scenario, that's what they did. It's a little different. It's line, PTY. Zero four, zero space four, something. Okay, what that does is that means that at any given time you could be running four telnet sessions on that particular device. Okay, remember it's binary, right? You start with zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So then we set the password, we use the same password we want. Let's go. And we'll do the nice login. You see that follows a pattern. Then an exit, and we're there. <clears throat> so now somebody can come in and log in remotely into this device using the Telnet protocol. Okay. Just so you guys know the real world is about it. Telnet, Telnet <clears throat> has things in clear text. So if you were if somebody was running something like Wireshark, you guys seen Wireshark? That's yeah, a pretty nice tool. It doesn't matter as ever tended to do, but if you're running Wireshark and you, people are using uh, even websites, most of them now are protected with HTTPS, the secure protocol. If they're not, you can pick up the username and passwords. Okay, so are we doing okay? Is it making sense, guys? All right. Okay. Uh, so we've gone through those password encryption. Uh, some of the other things are setting up a message of the day banner, which is pretty simple as well. So it's basically the command is banner LTD for message of the day. You're going to use a delimiter, which means like in programming, you're basically setting what's going to be seen on the screen. And say something like 
No, I better not say that you need video before. <laughs> nope. In my classic city, I, think, I do things like death calls to anybody who comes into our network. You know, sort of on, on your list here, you have different letters at the beginning and the end. Letterhead right, the it, it can change a little bit. Uh, you could do it this way. Whoops. Uh, that's a typo. Sorry about that. Yeah, well, no, I was just saying, you, you got a hash mark at the beginning and a. And yeah, it's a hash, two hash marks. Yeah, but then you have a quote at the end. Right. So it should be a quote, hash mark. Hash mark at the end, sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. So if I had a syllabus like at college right now, I'd say I have the right to change things to the syllabus so get ready to cross through that last one. Yeah. Put a hash mark. Okay. In fact, perfect time here, right? Yeah. address. 
abbreviation I A D R, which put in a standard C address when I to the that call to okay, so with that you have to put in the subnet mask. So in the scenarios, are you guys familiar with subnet mask? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that too, so you can see how scenarios. Let's put one in so you can see what this is and how to turn it on. You can't use CIDR implementation. No, nope. okay. not Packet Tracer, unfortunately. Okay. There's some differences in Packet Tracer and the real deal. Okay. The real deal, you can do everything. Packet Tracer has a few limitations. So it'd be nice if we could, but unfortunately we can't. So in this case, it's just a standard Class C. The standard Class C subnet mask is 255.255. .255. So now the interface has an IP address. That's something that's so it can, it can communicate. Okay, we always want to make sure we type in no shutdown. And now you see the lines changed up. Addicted to using, you know, multiple monitors. 
Yeah. It's a bad thing. I think. Okay, so again, those first three octets to the left, never portion. Last octet, post portion. So our network address in this case would be I'll get it in fact figure the keyboard. That would be our network address. That's what the routing protocols want. Okay. That's going to be turned off your entrance, yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say for comp just a note for the competition too. I mean you can use online subnet calculators, so if you're not sure what the network address is, you can find an online calculator, put in your address in your subnet, and it will tell you what your host uh, your what your network address and your broadcast addresses are. Right. That'll make it a little easier. Than the standard way, which is to make you do on the certification, which is you got to turn things into binary. Yeah. Yes. Is that something that's easily searched for? So he could show that on the screen tonight. Yeah, you can, you can Google. Is that something? That there. We, we use it for the networking. Yeah, I never use it. Because I'd like to see what that looks like yeah. and get that on camera tonight. I'll tell you if I'm online or not. Second that. The the login and the password are on the white paper to your left. Yeah, I, they never came up for me. There you go. Click here to join the network. There we go. Up there, so it's vision, right? It's capital G, I think, for the, I don't know if it's yeah. case sensitive for the username or not, but. It is for password. And then vision. By the way, I never use the keyboard, the laptop keyboard either, so. Okay. So yeah, if your caps lock is on, you have to take that off for vision. Uh, capital V, I, S, O, N, I believe. That's what worked for me. It's just one capital V and then the rest of the case. Try uh, just yeah, sure. capital G. Let me try it all caps. Let's see. Well, I I got through with the lower case. Okay. I don't get to do much here tonight, so. It's all okay. So I'm going to have to type the rest of the stuff, too. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies. Please work. Please work. Please work. There, yeah. Of course. Awesome. See, I, I provide full service. To do that. I provide full service, Kevin. <laughs> Right. Off the top. Right here. Right? 
Of the top. Okay. Uh, at the very top. So where it says sub it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. So they, they will do a calculator where you can do it based on the number of bits. Right. Rather than uh, just the standard ABC. So basically, yeah. Yeah. This, and, and what they have, guys, is side notation. So, okay, let me explain that real quick. I can give it that to you in just half a second here. Side notation is the same thing as this. Remember all these turned in binary ones? So we have eight binary ones here, here, and here. That means that that's our side notation, slash 24. We just count the ones. Is there another question too? Does that make sense, guys? So if it was, for example, just for the sake of work, this, what would our side notation be, guys? Very good, 16. So what uh, Mr. Brewer was saying is actually what we're good to up here is a lot because it's going to, what I saw here, and Cisco does it all the time in their scenarios, they put side notation, which is the same thing as that subnet mask, and pack treasure won't let you put it in there. The main reason I brought it up is, is because on the network quiz portion, they do ask about the question involving side notation. So knowing where both of those are on the calculator is very helpful. Yeah, they let you guess research that. That's great. There's really no point to be guessing if yeah. you can find the information, which is what technology is all about. Yep. Yeah. As long as it's publicly available, you can use it. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. And free. Publicly available and free. <laughs> <laughs> There's still a few of those things. So basically, you just Google IP subnet calculator, that'll give you the same thing. Screen. Okay. Oh, I didn't know I was getting that. Oh, we're ready again? Yeah. Oh, okay. I should start, stop and start. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay, so uh, some other things we need to shut down. I don't know if they'll bother you guys with clock rate. They may or may not. Um, it's hard to tell what they'll have on there. That's the question. Yeah, I haven't seen enough of them yet to have a good feel yeah. for what they're coming. You know, I haven't seen it, but I think just for the sake of argument, I'm going to do one just to, just in case you guys run into that. So if we take our router again, and we look at the physical area, I added this. This is called a, a serial port. And probably won't want to put anything else over there. Oh, it does. Nice. Okay. Oh. Just slide it down. It's a bit very tempting now. You want to put it in one screen? Yeah, let's see if we'll put it down here. Okay. Put it in the same type of port here. to branch off into another router and they tell you it's a WAN connection, you're going to need what's called serial cable. And I don't know how much, if you guys check all the different cables that you have access to, so this nice little lightning bolt down here, basically gives you access and then just mouse over and it'll tell you what they are. So if we look at this, we have a, we'll just take this serial cable here, that's the DTE and do it again. We'll do it this way, grab that cable. Add one click here. We know it's a serial port, right? So we'll take this port here, drop down here, and we'll hook it to this particular serial port. Okay, so if you need to make another connection, that's easy to do. And again, that, our friend the lightning bolt, we just mouse over all these, it'll tell us exactly what we need. So you guys are familiar with crossover and straight through cables, right? How they work, what they are. So very quickly, so think of it this way. Unlike devices, generally use what's called a straight through cable, which are these cables up here. These dotted cables are what are called crossovers. The pin settings and the wires are turned over, so there's a circuit that's completed from here to here. Out here, the switch is completing the circuit. 
It's kind of in the old days what they call null mode. Okay. So WAN links are going to use serial cables. If we use generally like devices, think of the cloud. I hate the cloud, by the way. It doesn't always, it doesn't always work like it should in this, but hopefully it will for your case. Okay. But you see a switch to a switch. They're using a nice crossover cable. Switch to the PC, switch to a printer, switch to an access point, or you can straight use. Just a different type of cable. Okay. If they actually ask you to get rid of something, just in case they actually ask you to do that, that nice check, nice X out here. It's locked so you can't get rid of it, but if you need to, there's that. You want to check a quick way to generally check the connections to make sure they're good or working. You have this envelope out here. You click on it, click your starting point, <coughs> click your ending point, and you see that it's successful. So that'll save you a little time while we're doing. You guys remember the pink command, right? Pink command, basically it's the old submarine thing, right? We're pinging, looking for red October. Red October's out there, we get a reflection back, an echo back. Okay. But this is this will work the same way. It'll save you a little time using the envelope versus having to go into each of these post devices, these uh, PCs and servers to make sure the connection points are good. Okay, we doing okay guys? You hanging in there? Yeah. Okay, good. I know so it's easier for me to talk than just for you guys to sit. That's all the way it is. Uh, some other things. So on the PCs and on the servers, you have of course the physical view of what they look like, your configuration settings. Services is something you may not have seen yet. So for example, they have all these different services available. One they talk about the scenario is NTP. See that it's just simply clicking the enable button here, and there's a key. I'll show you guys what they're looking for when they tell you to connect the router to the NTP circuit. Okay, NTP is a network time program. Everything on a network has to be within a certain amount of time of each other, or they won't talk to each other. So it's actually become a lot bigger deal. And this is the reason. So there, let's see, let's see, let's see. You know, your teacher would make a good example. Yeah, me too. So there he is, and Justin has been taking some classes at City College, and he's got a step further. He's been doing some learning on his own. You know, he's gone over to DEF CON and Black Hat. <laughs> and he's realized that, you know, it's important if you're going to go in and look for information and valuable information on servers, for example, it's not only good to make sure you change the logs so that you wipe your feet on the way out so people don't think anybody's been there. That's the trick. And sometimes you may do something like this. So your teacher generally works probably, uh, I would guess he's up at 5 in the morning, and he probably finishes up about midnight, right? I think that's probably his work day. So we would assume that any time he's working, he'd be working in those hours, we'd have logs. But for some reason, when we catch an intruder, the time is, the time is not the time that he's working. So it doesn't look like it's him, right? But he might have gotten a DEF CON Black Hat and figured out how to go in and change the protocol and change it on the server so it, it looks like the entry's done at a different time than when he's working. He's a pretty smart guy. I think he would do it. Or could do it. I wouldn't do it. Could do it. Okay, that's why they're looking at something like this. Okay, so all the services are pretty simple. HTTP. You can turn it off and turn on. Generally, the best approach, depending on what they tell you, is going to be turning this one off. Turning, make sure HTTPS is on. Uh, I don't know if they'll ask about DHCP, but basically, DHCP works for you guys just like it does at home. How many people have wireless access points? Wow, you guys are behind the time. It's Jerusalem, it's got one of me. So they don't generally use DHCP. 
you have ports, right? You plug in to the back a new laptop, one of your friends is going to come over and play a game with you. They automatically get an IP address, that's so DHCP. Yeah. And they'll have ranges. So if you need to find that, turn the service on, simply turn it on there. Any of the protocols you need, uh, TFTP is a way to save the files from, to a server. In other words, save the configuration files of the Cisco device to the server. Because everything we're doing, the, config, the file that we're doing and we're working on, configuration file. Okay. Our configuration file, that's another thing that probably will help you with this as well. If you go to privilege mode and do a show run, that's going to tell you what the router mouse is or what the switch is. So, for example, and of course we hit, see that nice more down at the bottom? Generally it's easiest to just hit the space bar and page through one page at a time. But we can see, hey, we've got an interface, and that's its number, and that's its IP address. We can see other things too. We can see we've got serial ports. We can see that there's a VLAN 1 that hasn't been sent. We can see a message in the day banner. We can see that somebody has actually set Telnet to log in remote. And we can actually see the password. You guys won't have to worry about this yet, but down the road, if you work with this kind of equipment, you know learn how to lock it down. Because a lot of people take Cisco buses everywhere. It's pretty big. So people can get in these pretty easy if you don't actually secure them. But do a show run, we'll show you all kinds of things that you might be finding. Okay. Are we doing okay? Make sense. Okay. Uh, to do things like, if you want to show you guys how to set up a routing protocol, and we have to go back into configuration. So. So to set up any routing protocol, and they might ask you to set up, in this case, in case they ask for RIP version 2. So what you type in is router, the routing protocol you're going to use, which in this case is RIP RIP. Brings us into a new block. So the next thing we have to do when they ask us for version 2 is to type in simply version 2. Which is an updated, updated grid router. I just got to go by some of the things they have in this, this particular scenario. Okay, once you do that, life's pretty good except you have to set those network addresses. So again, okay, our network addresses should be on this side of the router, and it'll be a different network on this side. It's going to be concerned about who it's connected to. So on this side, I think our remember is a 172 configuration. Let's see. It gave us a scenario. Okay. So on the right hand side, where you're sitting up with this network address. 172.16.124.1. You see the CIDR notation? So if we convert the CIDR notation into standard subnet language, what's it going to look like? Very good. 255.255.255.0. All we're doing is taking 255, plugging it into the standard binary chart, turning it into binary each time, the same chart for each octet. So a standard chart would be. All columns. We 
simply take any decimal number and divide it and start it here. So if we had 255, could we divide 255 into one, I'm sorry, could we divide 128 into 255? Yeah, and we'll get a one. We divide 64 of the remainder, yes, so we'll go all the way through. So that's how they're getting that cider notation. You can also take cider notation and plug it back into these. So for example, let's say we had um, cider notation, well, let's keep it like what we have up here. Let's say, let's say originally we started out with cider notation 24. Yeah, I, I, it's good information, but I'm not sure that, that for what we're going to be doing. I'm trying to get a little background so they understand. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it's hard to know. It's hard to know what they're asking. Yeah. Um, Skip, how many times have you seen the packet tracer element that comes with the competition? I've only yeah, seen it. Just, just the one. Just once, yeah. So it's really hard for us to say what they're right. going to provide us this year. I can tell you this though, this past year has been the year to reinvent themselves. They've thrown a lot of new stuff at us and they've definitely stepped up the level of difficulty. So whatever we saw last year, I'm pretty sure we'll see more this year. Okay. So you can't go wrong with what you've got for us tonight. Okay, okay. So, okay, so let's do this. Is that picture of Packet Tracer a, a, a JPEG, or is that a, a functioning network that you had up there a moment ago? That's it's a it's a network, but it's not functioning. It's the one that uh, Skip gave me. Okay. Is there time tonight to pick one red dot and change it to a green? Sure, we can do that again. Uh, oh, you already did it. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. It's totally easy. Awesome. Great job, Kevin. Thank you. You're welcome. I was ahead of the curve for a change. <laughs> Moodle, so is this your learning management system? Uh, this is uh, the one for Los Rios. Okay. It's actually the main one is D2L. There's me and about eight people from American River there. We're still, we're still within the magical Los Rios firewall. They asked us to move ours inside. I see. We just tend to like it a little bit better. Got it. Uh, I think it Did your math teacher ever tell you that uh, 
you know, it's not just using a calculator, but it's actually not how the calculations work. Yeah. I bet you said that. <laughs> Don't buy that. That's what I tell my students all the time. Calculator's great, but you still have to know what goes into it to actually understand what's going on. You didn't say that? Yeah, he said that. Yeah, he said that. I know, yeah, I figured you would. Okay. Uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? That's what needs a good job, yes. Because if you don't understand how the calculations go into something like this, you can't troubleshoot it, you can't fix it. Right. right. Uh, just in case they were to do something else to you, which you never know. What this was. There's a protocol called CDP or Cisco Discovery Protocol which they tell you about, but they really don't want you, they don't want people to actually use it in most cases. Because what it does is, you have a router here, Cisco router here, Cisco router here. If you're running that protocol, somebody could come in and go, hey, I wonder what that one's name is and what its IP addresses are. That's what that protocol does. So in reality, most time you're gonna turn it off. So generally, you've got a no CDP run, they ask you, that turns it off. You can also turn it off at the interfaces. That one they could hit you with because that's pretty simple. Nice. Some people still run, I've seen it run recently to the day was. But they were trying to do some troubleshoot. Okay. So that was a good one to turn off. Uh, some other quick things. If, for example, they were to ask you what routing protocol is currently running, you can either do a show run to find it, or you can simply do a show IP protocols. Oops, I'm not going to spell No, this might be, uh, you know, actually this might be a packet tracer issue. I'm trying to remember the packet. Yeah, it should be. Well, I mean, there's nothing running to it. Uh, I was just going to say, because it was showing that you've got a syntax error. Oh, maybe it's the spelling. Yeah, because it showed protocols, not protocols. Maybe, let's find out. Are you, I'm sorry, yeah. I still spelled wrong. Protocols. Protocols. There we go. There we go. Yeah, I like that. Last we spell right. Okay. Now, you, now at least it's not an error. It's, it didn't give you anything. But yeah. Uh, the, the trouble is, you never know on some of these when you're going to run into one that just doesn't work. It works in real life, but not. Yes. Yeah. Uh, the other thing, of course, to speed up the process, you guys know you can page through the history and see what's been typed in before, right? Okay, good. That'll save you some time. Configuration file. So that's on, like, sorry, the page number or something. That's basically copy, run, start. You can just hit the default of the name. And now it's saved the configuration file to the router of what's called NVRAM, not volatile RAM. And that way, if the power goes out, or if you're with some agencies, do the same they call a power cycle router, which means you can turn it off and turn it on. There's a file that's held there. So when, it, when the router comes back up, it looks at that file and says, oh, now I know my name. Now I know my addresses. Now I know what I'm supposed to do. Can you uh, show how to uh, okay. I can't remember this if this there had been set up these static routes or not. Sure. And then the other thing if you have time, oh, we have, we have a little bit of time. Um, I at least kind of explain what a VLAN is and, and basically sure. uh, how you configure one. Right. 
Okay, if they ask you to set up the stack router, in other words, routers use both dynamic routing, which is being a routing protocol, like we saw with RIP, or you can manually tell the router what you want it to do, which is more secure, and you can do things like cut down on your amount of memory you need to have. It's like you guys have, you guys have your PCs at home. So do you guys only have like uh, one mega RAM? <laughs> Sure. 256. More is better, right? Okay. Well, in the, in the IT world, sometimes your boss may come to you and say, can we, get, can we make these last a little longer? Stretch the budget, right? That's what, one of the good things that static routes are, are good for because a routing protocol is going to talk a lot. Kind of like Microsoft's operating system is, it's, it can have a lot of things going on. If you put static routes in, you've got just those routes. Otherwise, routing protocols tend to get busy, make the routing tables very large. And you do this for several reasons. Security is one, make it easy to get to the next site. Lots of different reasons. So if we were going to set a routing protocol, I should have set it around. Command, I have it written down too somewhere. <coughs> I guess I didn't. Sorry. Okay, I'll type it in and we'll show you guys how it works. I see students come by to do some time to do this. That's my turn. Okay, so the command would be IP route. You're going to point it, so for example, you're on this router and we wanted to get to here, we're going to point to this network. IP router on this router pointing it to here. We'll just call it 192.168.1.0 like we did before. Okay. Then we have to put in its subnet password. Of the destination network we're going to. Then we have a choice. We can point it to, this one's going to be tough. It's not a great example, but you have two choices. IP route, destination network address, destination subnet mask, and then either type in the, the interface number it's leaving from in the router, or point it to the next router's address that you have. So if we looked at it, let's see. It's going to be stuck with I think that was whatever it was. We go F A zero slash one. It's not allowed because this one's lit, it's not allowed to talk. Okay, so again, we're just pointing it to where we want it to go. We're going to tell them when a packet comes in for this network, this network out here. Packet comes into this router from any parts over here. It needs to get to here. IP route, this destination network address, its subnet mask, and the outgoing interface, FA01. Or the only thing we would change if it doesn't like it, sometimes the Cisco LAN doesn't always like the, the exit interface. You might just type in IP route, destination network, its destination network address. And let's say that this router was 192.168.1.10. We would put that in. Push against the next router. Does that make that a little easier to see? Yeah. That router is not, not connected. So we're just having to determine. Is that router connected to? Yeah. This, well, here, the, in this particular diagram, here's the problem. This is a cloud. So, these routers are kind of underneath the cloud. You don't exactly know what they are, what their addresses are. So, for example, you guys ever use, you guys use TraceRoute before, right? Yes. And that's be very stupid. So 
it's going to go through every router and report back. We'll find out if they have a firewall here, but so far it's looking pretty good. Hmm. Yeah, firewall. I don't think we're going to go anywhere. Okay. So, you might think you could find out what the next router is, but the internet doesn't work like that. Okay. Packets, the information travel, and what the best route is at any given moment in time that it changes. So, for example, if you were going to head north and go to, you guys ever been to Woodland? Okay, you probably normally take I 5, get to Woodland, right? But also, you find out that uh, uh -oh, there's a big accident by Arco Arena. You can go that way, but you're going to be sitting there. Or you can take Interstate 80. Take 113 and go up to Davis, you're going to get there sooner, but it's going to be a little further. That's how it works. Things change all the time. So you can't count. They've got a good firewall here. <laughs> On some of you, if you try this at home, you'll, you'll get a little farther out. You can see they'll report back the IP addresses and the names. Huh. But it's only good for that moment in time, because the next time it might take a So what else should we look at? We copy the configuration. Um, they could actually, because I believe in the scenario, I think, we did have a TFTP server or something. Uh, I think what I saw, I thought, well, it was running up here. But so let's let's say, for example, you need to save a backup copy of your configuration. And by the way, you always need a backup copy. Because if you don't have one, your network is down and people are calling you and they're not telling you how well the network is running. And you don't want that. It's kind of like, if you guys ever typed a big paper and then something happened to the hard drive or you forgot to save it or something along those lines, <laughs> nobody wants that, right? So, you should, should always save the configuration to the actual device, copy, run, start, and we'll save it there. Or you can simply, if you save it out to something like a TFTP server, it's just, uh, copy the running configuration, copy run. VLANs allow us to ignore the physical 
network topology and do what we need to do. So in other words, if we have a physical network in here, we can take every other PC if we want, put it on different virtual LANs, we're talking to other LANs out there. It's a way to actually go in and make things a lot easier. There's a little more security, you can control your traffic better, there's lots of different things you can do. And anywhere you go, you're going to see a people, regardless. They're everywhere. So, so think of a VLAN. If you look there, you set VLANs to start with on your switches. Most of these same commands will work on the switch. But in particular, this is where you do most of the work with VLANs. So, you see here we've got inter interface VLAN 1. We give it an IP address.
need add a driver software. Be careful what you're pulling down because somebody put a, you guys know what a root kit is? Yes. Somebody put one on his machine and all his virtual gold and everything disappeared. And, uh, but it was a good life lesson. You guys know what farmers are in the gaming world, right? Yes. I thought you they harvest other people's virtual treasures. Okay, so um, it's hard. Okay, so the other thing we want to do on the switch, okay, in global configuration, see where I have IP default gateway and a number? You're going to do that because when you're setting up virtual LANs, you're going to point them to that gateway they need to get to. It has to be set on the switch. That was in the scenario, too. Okay, the next item, if we look at the paper there, at the, at the information below. Interface, fast ethernet 01. The next command, switch port, mode, and trunk. And they have that in the scenario as well. So what that does is this. Let's say you're on this switch, which is the perfect example. And you want all these devices that are connect to it, connected to it to be able to get to the gateway. First, you have to put the IP default gateway pointing to it, right? I'm sorry, that's not a good example. That's not where I want the trunk. Okay. I think they did actually use the third. Okay. We'll normally do that, but. Okay. <laughs> here's, the, here's the way it works trunk means that's a faster connection point. Generally, the trunk is done between switches. On the port that's connected here, and the port connected here is run both ways on both the goes switch port, mode, access, and trunk. It's like setting up a highway. So all these devices are sending traffic, right? You want to run it at the highest speed you can. That's trunk. And it does other things as well. The other ports, if they ask you, say out to the servers, out to the client devices, would be switch port mode, access. That's, the type, that's what they need two different types. So between the devices would be trunking. From the switch to the end devices would be switch port mode access. Will we go through the same process here? Correct. Right. 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 So. And the other thing they can ask you to do is, is set up what's called the encapsulation. So when you set the trunking port, one way to do is set out the trunking ports, but the encapsulation, and they were using what was called dot one q in the end of the scenario. Encapsulation is a way that the data is formatted. Encapsulation on one end of one system coming into another for it to be read, it has to be the same. Router one, router two, encapsulation has to be the same. You put a different type of encapsulation on one, Different type on the other, they won't talk to each other. Okay, oh, NTP on the next page. So, they have an NTP server in the mix. So, what they were doing was they wanted you to set up the router to make sure it's connected to the NTP server. So I have written down what you have there. The only part I did not put in there, because I didn't see it too later, was this one part. So when you want to make sure that it's connected to it, it's NTP server, the IP address, whatever it may be. Kevin, could you put that up or down so the line is not going through what you're typing? Oh, uh, yeah. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So NTP server, the IP address, and looking on the server, I'm trying to remember which one it was. Oh, that one, yeah, it's like this one, right? Oops. You look at services, you look at oh, that's not the one. Services. I bet zero here. It's out here somewhere. There was one in here that had it showed the key number. There it is.
yet, but the key number is over at that. You need the IP address of it and the key number. So if you, it should tell you, I can't remember if it told you exactly the center which one it was, yeah. but you could go out there and look for it, look under services and find it pretty quickly. They actually had one of the scenarios, they gave you the IP address, but if you put that, sorry, that was one for sort of, it had, wasn't turned on yet. That was the problem. So you had, they actually had to go out there and turn it on and put the key in. Right. And, the, and you're going to have those kind of things. You're going to need to know, for example, are we getting a connection from here to wherever it's belonging to? Oh, that's not good. They tell you there's some spots where some parts of the network should reach other parts. But again, using the envelope is going to tell you pretty quickly if you have connection. Without having to go into everything like do this, oops, to, to be happy with the triggers desktop and do ping and an IP address, right? Use the envelope and stuff much quicker. Yeah. Just to make sure though, I would always do it twice. Sometimes a packet tracer hangs up. This is a virtual machine. Doesn't work, try it one more time just to see. Okay. Um, we can talk quickly about access lists. A couple of things there. Uh, what they were doing was they wanted what's called an extended access control list from the scenario, which means that it's going to permit or deny devices, networks, or subnets based on IP address ranges and protocols. So in other words, you can get very granular with access control lists take people a while to get a handle. But for example, you could say, okay, we're going to deny everybody in this group from getting over to this side if they're using Telnet. We could say we will block just these two machines and let everybody else go. You can actually, I've had to do it in part of the academy, take every computer in the room and go every other one in an access control system. Yeah. You can, they get very hairy. Yeah. They get very long. They can get very deep. So, in the real world, of course, again, you would have a copy and you would actually use what are called named access control lists because you can actually edit them on the devices. Standards, extendeds, you have to wipe out the whole thing and start again. You can do things like use notepad, type up in there, or copy in there, and edit in there, and then put it back on the top. So, if you look at the way it works, I show basically uh, first, the example I give you, in case they want you to keep the ping from being echoed back or used, that would be a command there. Access list, one one deny, ICP, which is protocol used by ping, any, any, which because it's an extended list. I know it's kind of hard, it's going to be short time on this one. This one takes a few sessions to actually get pretty good. The first thing is to actually create it. You're going to create it on the device in global configuration. Second step is what you see there, applying it to the interface. So I give you an access list there. It shows that I can pick our host if they're going to use Telnet. Another access list <coughs> with a different network. Then permit anything else. Okay. So the two things are this: create the, create the list, then apply it to the interface. You apply it going in or coming out. If they ask you where to place the list. It depends on how they ask. So quickly again, create it, apply it to the interface, you have to give it a direction. And then, placement is this. Since this is an extended access control list, let's say we're trying to keep this network from gaining access to the server over here. If that's the case, we can put an extended list as close to what we're trying to deny or prevent. So that way, if the judgment is made here, a standard would be all the way here, which takes up, takes more traffic, takes up more bandwidth. So with an extended again, you're going to place it as close as possible. Again, it's on the router. If we're trying to keep this network from getting access to this device, we would put the access list here going in. Does that help a little bit? I know it's a lot of stuff. Though. Yeah. So you're blocking it before it goes through that. Correct. Correct. Standard would say, if we're trying to protect this, 
Actually, this scenario, we would actually put this is the closest router we would put in here. But then that traffic is still going to come all the way from this direction. If we use extended, we can put it here. If it works and the test is good, it comes all the way through and goes to where it's supposed to. If, it's, if they're trying to get to this server, then it's not right here. So you save a lot of bandwidth. You, save, you keep your network performance up. So, did you guys drink for the garden hose and knowledge tonight? Or the fire hose and knowledge? So let's see. So if I was to ask you guys some questions, like, what, um, what would the prompt look like if you were in privilege mode, what was the last character? Contingent. I know that we also have 
low number teams and then some high number team yeah. numbers. So uh, I don't know what it's going to take, but it's going to take time, it's going to take dedication, and it's going to take collaboration. And so uh, I know that Monterey Trail High School and Elk Grove High School are getting together for a boot camp on Tuesday. I would like to encourage other schools to talk to local schools, schools that are close by, and try to put together a boot camp of your own. Through collaboration, you guys can have a synergistic effect, and I'm hoping that all teams will benefit from that collaboration. Uh, for platinum teams, we're going to talk about plat uh, packet tracer, but all teams have to talk about Cisco Networking Challenge quiz. You've got to get on to netacad.com, you've got to go through those modules, and you've got to know by the back, by the back of your hand. If you don't prepare for it, it's going to be a problem. You, you can use Google, but you're using a time. Exactly. You know the stuff, you can get that out of the way and move on to other things. Uh, so, I mean, I, I know that we had one team, one of our teams, that had much preparation at all, these we wanted this one question. So you could do it, but it took them probably an hour to do it, as opposed to being done in 15 minutes. All right, so bottom line is this. If you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. So make sure you make a plan. Thank you, everybody. Right. Have a good night and a safe trip home. Appreciate it.